while because he finally stopped. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's omniscient. He knows everything that's perfect. Amen? Right? He, he's, he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's good. And if you move away from good, you've stepped into the world of evil. Would you agree with that? From perfect, all you can do is go downhill. And, and so when we're talking about good and evil, we're not talking about man's opinion. We're talking about God, who uh, we're not asking God for his opinion. An opinion implies what? We're not sure if it's exactly right. We're, we're here for God's truth. 
absolute truth. We, we moved away from absolute truth to something called relative truth. Have you ever heard of that? That's all relative. I'm not talking about all our relatives. We're talking about it's all relative, meaning what? Well, I know God says this, but for me, this is what I think. Now you move from truth to opinion. Would you agree with that statement? If we trust God and we believe God and we believe His Word, then that's truth, God. In my opinion, anything other than truth is just that. It's just opinion. Early in, in kids' lives in, in school, they, they start uh, learning the difference between fact and opinion. Somebody points to the sky and says, is that blue? And the kid says, then they ask the kid, is that uh, fact or opinion? Well, it is. It's blue, so that's fact. Uh, blue is the best color in the world. That's opinion. Right? It's relative to whoever likes blue more than any other, uh, other color. And so we move to this moral relativism, or, or instead of truth, we, we, well, it's, it's how it appeals to me. The scary thing about that, church, is who becomes God? If I get to discern what truth is, if I get to not discern, but, but state what truth is, who becomes God of my life? Me. Amen? I mean, if I get to say, this is how it is, then, then I'm saying, God, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and that's a scary place to be. Because as we said before in the previous sermon during the Psalms, if we confess that He is Lord, if we submit to His authority, to His truth, then my opinion doesn't matter as far as changing truth. But it does matter in terms of worshiping Him and honoring Him and truly treating Him as Lord. And if I do it any different way, I am confusing anybody else that says, I'm a Christian, but I don't trust Him. Would that be confusing to someone? When the very way we become a Christian is to say, I trust you, Jesus, to be my Lord and your truth to be my truth. Does that make sense? And with that stated for a second introduction, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. I pray, Father, for, Lord, this, not only this lost and dying world, but, Father, any time that, that my silly mind chooses to disagree with my maker, with my creator. Father, I know that you're perfect. I know your word is perfect. I know your way is perfect. Help for me, Father, with my broken brain to, to not only know that, but, but remember it through every act that I make. Father, I praise you in Jesus' name. One of the tough things about being in a, in a world where we have so many opinions and, and we're told that we're always to value, this, we value every person, amen? The church values every person, but do we value every opinion? No. It has a certain place. It, it tells us about lostness or savedness or someone who's saved and living lost. <laughs> amen? Because we can do that. We can be saved and nobody know it but us and God and maybe a few people who will witness it when it happens. Now, does that mean it's okay with God? No, it's not okay with God. Because again, it confuses people around us. What will He do? In His wonderful ways, He will correct us, chastise, uh, uh, limit us in certain ways until we turn back to it. Anybody ever been away and came back? Was it, was it pleasant when we were away? There were some things, it's kind of like when you first rebel, like the little kid running away from home at six years old. When he goes through that door, he is free. I don't know if y'all did this, because when I was a kid, people would, would have a stick with a, 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 a bandana tied on the end and leave with their bologna sandwich. That's how you ran away back then. It's different now. You take your, your uh, uh, computer or your iPhone or whatever. But anyway, that's how it was back then. And you're free, and you get to the edge of the walk, and you realize nobody's going to drive me anywhere. And then it's, going to, it's about lunchtime in a couple hours and you're already hungry and you're not going to have anything to eat, you know. And, and you're not going to have any of those wonderful provisions. And it's not as fun when you get there. But when you go through the door, boy, you go high. I don't have to put up with this anymore. Wouldn't let me watch uh, Scooby Doo or whatever. What's, what's the cartoons now? SpongeBob. Or, that's over too now. Isn't it? I can't keep up with them. But anyway, whatever it was, but feeling powerful to going through it. But once you get out there, and then you have to defend yourself when you're out there. Well, I had to leave because of this and that. Do we do that to God? God didn't understand me. God didn't understand my desires and all those kind of things. 
And, and then we can get confused. We can get mad. We can get hurt. We can get all of those kind of things to where our mind is kind of mixed up. Have you ever been uh, out and you didn't... Uh, and I can remember this hunting in the woods. When you get out on a cloudy day, and it might be woods that you've been in before, but where I hunted, it was other people's land. They, 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 back then, you could hunt anywhere in, in the woods. And, out, and you, you know, a couple thousand acres. And so get out in the river swamps along the Sabine River somewhere, and, and, and then say, okay, which way was home? And you look for the sun, S-U-N, and it's nowhere to be seen. <coughs> and suddenly, you know where everything is, you just don't know where you are. And you don't know which way to go. And if you could have the sun, you could say, well, it'd be east or west, depending on the time of the day, it'd be noon, whatever. But you, you could have some way of keeping a direction going. What would you need then to find the direction back home? A compass would be great. When your senses no longer tell you which way to go, then some instrument would be great, wouldn't it, to get you home? Because, you know, there's going to be something good cooked for too long and you might miss out on it. You know, whatever it is, it's there. Do we have a compass to get through life? Yeah, God's powerful spirit. As, and, and how do we understand it? The Bible tells us it will never go outside the Bible. God will never break His Word. Amen? God puts that limitation on Himself. God is not a liar. He is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the what? Truth and the life. And so that's important to know. So when I'm confused, how do I know if I'm confused? Because I'll be honest with you, sometimes when I was most confused, I thought I was the most right. Anybody ever been there? It's called being 16. And some of us stay 16 for a lot of years. <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? But I thought I was the most right. I needed an instrument to tell me. And God's going to do that. In fact, if you look up on the wall, the, the handwriting on the wall, it, it, way back in Psalms, in the Old Testament, it said, Your word. Right? I, I love it. At Dry Creek, whenever they have the uh, uh, that song, Blessed Assurance, when they say, This is my story, they do this. This is my story. Right? This is it. This is the story that I believe. This is the truth. And, and so we have a lamp unto our feet. My brother and I got out there one night, pitch dark, no moon, no light. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And we were probably about a mile back. We had to follow the terrain of the land. Now, that was about the only way we knew we were coming out. We finally hit the hill coming up out of the swamp. We, we knew that we were within a mile of where we thought we were. <laughs> you know, and, and we made it out. But that's how dark it was that night. But the Word can bring us out of the darkness of confusion. Listen, the darkness of rebellion. As we go against the truth, the darkness of public opinion, right? The darkness of my opinion. If his truth is light and I'm following my opinion, I'm in darkness. So it says the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I know which way to go. And I need that. I'm not omniscient. That's the sound we like to hear. But I like to happen in first, but we love that sound. Parents, if I ever say something like that, don't get embarrassed. We, we're sincere. We love having these little ones with us. Uh, anyway, where would we find God's Word? In the Bible. Right? That, that's the Bible. But, but when we're talking about the Word, what else are we talking about? Well, in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was already there. Was there a King James or a Geneva Bible or a, a, a Hebrew scroll then, when, whenever Jesus was? No. Because the Word is God. What well, I'm saying, you, you ever said, uh, uh, my, my name is my bond, or that's who I am, it represents me? That's, that's what we have from the Bible, is God representing Himself to us, and representing His way. In the beginning of the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and when you get down to, to verse 14, and, and it also says, nothing was created without Him, that means you and me, wouldn't it? Uh, and the Bible says, uh, you knew me when I was being created in my mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made. When does life begin? In God's head, in God's heart, right? In, in the mother's womb, he is still there. Who was the first uh, uh, child that, that uh, recognized Jesus in Mary's womb? 
John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb. You know, so all of that is there. That's why it, it breaks our heart to hear uh, the, the numbers that we hear about, about the kids aborted. Forty percent in New York City uh, conceptions in an abortion. It's scary. Confused people who don't know. Right? They know about opinion, but they don't know about God. And then we can trust God. Anyway, goes on. And, and it says, and the Word became flesh and did what? It's supposed to come up on the wall in a second. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus came, and He is the Word. Everything that's the Bible is Him, and He's even in the Bible. But that's how much He chose to reveal to us. It's the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So what do we do with that? Well, first we need to know how important the Word is. Can you really believe this? How many of y'all have heard? The, well, it's been changed so many times. Have y'all heard that? Anybody? None of y'all heard that? You hear it all the time. You know, it's been changed so many times. God revalidates that for us every now and then. The Dead Street Sea Scrolls came up. And they said it's been changed. They dug out the Dead Sea Scrolls from the time of Jesus. <coughs> and Reverend says, that not changed. They say, well, there's this version and that version and that version. They all say something different. No, they're interpreting from the same scriptures into the English language. And they modernize it every now and then to match the language we use today. For example, if you went to the 1960s and said, that's the bomb, they would all be running for bomb shelters. Right? But in the 80s and 90s, suddenly that's the bomb, then what? That's cool. If you went to the 30s and said, that's cool, they'd go get a sweater. You know, and so our language does what? It tends to change, but God does it. And so they would go back and they would look at these. <laughs> I tend to read two or three different translations before I come and speak to you to find out the one that best represents God to uh, the language that we understand. Uh, but I can tell you this. I trust Scripture as God intended it to be read. Somebody goes to play with that's a whole different story. I'm talking about as God intended it, what it communicates from the original, as they say, autographs. How it was written originally. And if you know about the good translations, they go all the way back to the oldest text. And they reinterpret them into a language that we understand English and stuff. So, in this one it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Somebody did just sit down one day, well, I think this. And I think anybody does that, that's a sinner. And somebody don't do that, that's somebody else. No, all scripture is given by inspiration from who? God. Written with a human hand, inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, through many different authors. Same Holy Spirit. That's why this thing backs itself up from front to back. The more I understand the Bible, the, 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 did you know you can't always understand Revelation without reading Daniel? Written hundreds and hundreds of years ago, right? We're at what, 2019? So 2,000 plus a, uh, a few hundred years to back to down. But you can't understand Revelation until you get that. You know, all those kind of things. It, it's all in there. And it's amazing what God did with this uh, body of work. He said it's profitable for doctrine. Doctrine means understanding. Uh, of the truth. If you want to explain the truth to someone about Jesus, where do you go? To his revealing of himself. And, and he kept a lot of things secret, didn't he? Because it's just a little bitty book. How much did he want you to know about him? A bunch. It's vast what, what, what is here. Profitable for doctrine. Reproof. Reproof's an interesting word. Uh, for For correction. And for instruction in, in, in righteousness. We're going to come back to that. For a preview. So, what does God say about His Word? This is the written standard. And to say it's not, says, God, Holy Spirit, you're a liar. He didn't know what you was writing. He must have been off that day. Is that our God? No. Let me ask you something. Have you ever tried this thing? Now, listen, I don't mean have you ever felt how heavy it was. I don't even mean, have you ever read it? I'm talking about putting it into practice. Has it ever, has the Bible let you down? The Bible hasn't let me down. I've let me down. Other people's opinions have let me down. I've had preachers let me down. But the Word of God stands true. It's the one truth. You know, I, I taught school for 20-something years. I taught a lot of different things, facts about human life and all. The only facts I'll stand on are right here. That this is it. That that's the facts. I know with beyond a shadow of a doubt I can stand on. 
You say, Brother Darrell, you talk American history. What about that Constitution? I think democracy and, and our republic is an amazing thing. But I'm looking forward to living under a dictatorship. And I'm not talking about Hugo Chavez or, or, or Fidel Castro or, or any of that bunch. I'm talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. He's in absolute, absolute control. Right? I stand up on this one. It says that the man of God may be made complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Remember, you didn't get saved by your good works. By you were, because you were better than somebody else. Because you were cuter or because you were smarter. Because God felt sorry for you. It wasn't any of those things. We're saved by grace. But if you go read about being saved by grace and not of works, the next line says, But you were created to do good works that were there before you were born for you to do. And you say, well, how can I do it? I can't do this. Moses said, I stutter too much or whatever. All those kind of excuses why we can't. But who's going to empower you? God? When? When we're thoroughly equipped. How do we get equipped? We say, Jesus, I'm here. Show me what to do next. Then it says this. Not on my computer, but it says it. Paul is talking to Timothy. Paul is on death row for being such a great guy. Have you ever heard of that? Jesus was on death row, wasn't he? And, and there weren't any better. Never sinned, but he was on death row for a night. And the next day they took him to death. Well, here's Paul who just basically told Europe about, about uh, who Jesus is. And he comes to Timothy. He's trying to pass it on because he's fixing to leave this plan of existence. And he says, I charge you therefore uh, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That's an interesting story, another discussion. At his appearing and his kingdom. Two different things. And we, we talk about that if you come to study of Revelations at Matt's house. This week, is that right? Yeah. At 6 30 eating time. And then a little after that, we feed them with God's Word. But anyway, we're going to go to the next one, though. What was the most important thing that Timothy could do? What did he want to tell Timothy to do well, as soon as he was gone, as soon as he finished his assignment on earth and was with God? Absent from the body and present with the Lord. What do you want Timothy to do? Preach the Word. He said, I want you to go preach about uh, what the social issues of the day are. Is that what he said? He did. I want you to go and, and preach about who should win the Super Bowl. He didn't say that. I want you to go teach about the, the latest psychological developments. Uh, the, the, the smartest scientists in the world. Greatest theories and, and what we found out we could do. Is that what he said to do? He said to do what? Preach the word. Why? What's the only thing that's going to get us to heaven? You can follow other things you want to. They may get you to heaven sooner, or they may get you to hell sooner, but they're not what gets you to heaven. Right? And we talked spoke about this morning. I could talk about a lot of good stuff. And some of you would say, well, that's good for you, Daryl, but not for me. Remember that relativism? What side we're looking at it from? But one thing is universal for all of us, heaven and hell. It's coming to us, one or the other. And, and only the Word, the one that became flesh and dwelt among man, can get us to heaven. So my job is to preach the Word. Who else is called to be a kingdom uh, and a priesthood? Besides the, the preacher standing in front of the church. Who else is called to do that? To go there for and make disciples? The whole body of the church. And I'm a teacher, but there's a little difference between teaching and preaching. One, we're both to expose the Word of God. <clears throat> but preaching does what? It's talking about Jesus Christ and about salvation. It's telling the good news that you can go to heaven. It's also telling the good news, if you're going to heaven, you can be effective in getting more people to heaven. You can. How can you? By being in God's will. Can you be saved and out of God's will? Come on. Can we be saved and be out of God's will? Any of us have been there? Absolutely, we've all been there. Is that a good place to be? No. There's something that tells you the whole time that you're not there. No matter what comes out your mouth. There's something that tells you that the whole time that you're not there. What is it that tells you that? It's your personal GPS. God's powerful spirit in you. The spirit of the Father, the spirit of the Son, same spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in you. 
And, and he, he witnesses to you, to me, that, child, you're not there. I've got something better for you. Step over here. Step back into God's way. So he says, preach the word. Preaching demands an answer. We can deny it or we can receive it. Do I believe all people who have the name of preacher? No. Because it says preach the what? The word. And I would like to see that capitalized. Because I'm talking about the word, not a word. Amen? Why do we put it on the wall up there? Check. It's one of the reasons we put it on the wall. Is you know, if a lost person was to walk in and say, I wonder where he's getting that from. That's just his opinion. What's at the bottom of there? We got the footnote, don't we? Where in the Bible is it? You can look at it. So Brother Darrell is not spouting opinion. He's not being a Baptist today. He's not being a whatever. You know, he, he's doing what? God's Word. And, and preaching the man's an answer. And sometimes it makes us mad. You know why it makes us mad? We spoke about it this morning in Sunday school. I don't know if you notice. How many of you have a human body? Don't look around the room and wonder. But, but if you have a human body, we spoke about it this morning, it, it, it's going to go ashes to ashes and dust to dust. It's going to go back to dirt. And in Genesis, when, when the curse came on Adam and Eve, they didn't curse Adam and Eve, they cursed the ground. <coughs> this body is going to go back to being dust. It's going to be part of it. It's cursed. It's not getting to heaven. What's going to get to heaven? You. How many of you know that you were not your body? How many of you are so glad that we're not our body? <laughs> yeah. But we are not our body. Only who we are is going to heaven. We're going to get a new body. It's not the ground. It's not cursed. It'll last forever. Amen? How many of you are ready for a trade-in? This one's going to start to do things that it, 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 we didn't think it would ever do, but it's, it's doing them now. It wakes us up and we know we're alive, you know, by, by what the body's doing now. But, and yet... What claims most of our allegiance? The Holy Spirit leading us to Christ through His Word? Or our body that's going to die and go to destruction? Which one tends to lead us the most? Let's be honest for a minute. Our body. Our physical desires. That third piece of living brain. What our eyes like to see instead of what we should see. How powerful we feel when words come out of our mouth and should come out of our mouth. Amen? You, you, you get the point? Our minds that, that we allow to go different places instead of taking every thought captive. Because those don't glorify God. They glorify the body. The body says, I want it now. But we, as Christians, have the Holy Spirit that can say, there's something much better. And when, when we start saying no to the body, and I'm not saying don't enjoy life. He wants you to have life and life abundant. But I'm saying when we start saying no, body, that's not good for me or us or our witness. We're not helping anybody get to heaven. You stay there. I'm going with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do it His way. But your body says, no, you know how much you enjoy this. You know how that kind of thing can freeze you and makes you feel powerful and all that kind of stuff. How do we, how do we tell the body no? We need an instrument, don't we? Something that says What's my personal wants and lusts and desires? And what's of God? If only we had an instrument that could tell us which one those would be. Go preach the what? The Word. Don't preach what makes us comfortable. You know, I, I like comfort. How many of y'all like comfort? How comfortable was the rich man who denied the poor man Lazarus whenever he died in his body? Remember, he went to where? Sheol, the worst side of uh, waiting for, for the final judgment. And, and remember, he wanted Lazarus to go get a drop of water and put it on his tongue? Where was Lazarus, though, who had nothing to take care of his body, so he looked to God instead? Where was he? He was in the bosom of Abraham. Right? The bosom of Abraham. Would we trade a few years in the body for being useful to God? Listen. Useful to God for not temporary, momentary things, but for eternal things. Like bringing more people to heaven and showing people how to get there. Preach the word, church. We're called to preach the word. Not our opinion, not our comfort. Right? Not what feels good at the moment. But what 
Lord can bring people to an eternal heaven. And in a million years, these 70 or so years we have on earth, what will they mean? A million years from now, what will they mean? Well, my body really craved this. Now, I don't know if you know it, but your body can crave things that aren't good for you. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, again, if you like that, you can lemon rain pie. It'll show up. I have an instrument that shows it up. <laughs> you know? But what about someone who's addicted to, to drugs or alcohol? Your body is saying, I want it now. Right? What about, uh, did you know the most addictive thing for men is pornography? The Bible says that, that people start having lust and desires for, for ones that they should have never had, according to Scripture. Because our minds and our bodies say, that makes me feel good. That makes me feel complete. But it says, God, your truth is wrong. Only my opinion counts. How scary is that? God, I don't want this, baby. I don't know if I can afford it. Well, let me ask you something. How many of y'all starved to death so far? <coughs> Raise your hand if you've starved to death. Raise your hand if you've allowed your kids to starve to death. Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever thought that y'all weren't going to have enough money for next month. <laughs> sure. But what did God do? He honored you. Seek first the kingdom of God in His righteousness. I'll say it another way. His right way. And all these things will be added unto you. If we believe His Word. If we don't, we're going to live in fear. We're going to panic and we're going to do things that we all not have ever even thought about doing. And we're going to confuse people that don't know about heaven and hell. Because we're supposedly saved, but we, we play over here. I'm not talking about this side of the room. I'm just talking about this spot. <laughs> we play over here. Then what? <clears throat> My opinion says this is right for me. God's rules are for somebody else. God's truth can be questioned. Then what becomes Lord? My opinion and not God's truth. Look what it says. Be ready in season and out of season. What does that mean? When it's comfortable and when it's not. Let me say this and then close. It is getting less comfortable in this world that we live in. And it says in the Bible it's going to get that way in the latter days. It's getting less comfortable to tell God's word. You'll be called ugly names. You'll be called narrow-minded. Did you know that? You'll be called a hater because you said that horrible word. No, that's not right. We don't like the word no. Don't tell me no. Who are you to tell me no? Anybody ever use those terms? They just don't like me because they don't know what I like. Every one of us likes something we shouldn't. Would you agree with that? Every one of us do. When we start telling this dying body no, and say, God, you're more important than how I feel for the moment. Things change. God says, wow, I can trust that individual to love me more than his personal desires for that moment. I can use that person to reach somebody else and to reach somebody else. Amen? It all changes him. Even when it doesn't feel good. Did you know one of the... Part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. God Almighty, that means, will help you say no to self. Well, that's a popular idea today, isn't it? <laughs> no. How many people love to hear? Follow your own heart. <laughs> What's the Bible say about that? Your heart's deceptive. That's what the Bible says about that. To thy own self be true. That means you're God and Jesus said, The Bible says to him be true. Right? Brother Derek, you, you're not being nice to me today. That don't feel good. Listen, the kindest thing I can tell you, the kindest and most loving thing I can tell you, is God is right. And you have blessed assurance. The more you know Him, genuinely know Him, the more you're going to love Him. That's the kindest thing that I can tell you. To not tell you that. Remember that idea? Closed-minded Christians and all that kind of stuff. I am very narrow-minded about many things. And I'm happy with that. And I've used this before. How many of you, when you leave this place, are going to get on the right-hand side of the road and drive home? I'm narrow-minded that you do that. I want you to be on your side of the highway when you're going down the road. Is, am I being ugly by saying that? No, you may be saving my life or somebody else or your life. I'm very narrow-minded uh, about... Uh, 
Where are my wife and I are going to spend the night tonight? And who's going to be in our house? And those, I'm narrow minded about that. Is it because I hate other people? No. I'm narrow minded about who sells my, my kids' drugs. I want them to get them from Walmart, from the pharmacy, and not on the street somewhere. I'm narrow minded about that. And who's going to pass on to my grandkids? I am extremely narrow minded. Does that make me a hater? No. And so if I tell somebody the truth of God and His Word, I'm not hating. I'm doing my best to love them. And my definition of love, short of Jesus' love, is wanting the best for someone and helping them achieve it in a way God would approve. And that's what we're here for. Church, we're here to preach the Word. How does it come out? Hopefully gently, remember? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Self-control, faithfulness, those are all part of the Spirit. But we are to tell it. We're to proclaim it. And if we don't, I truly don't want the blood of people who heard me preach a sermon to be on my hands because I didn't do it the way God said. I sugarcoated it so much they didn't hear the essence of what it was. But I'm also not here to make people miserable or fuss or all that kind of stuff because I, too, am a sinner saved by grace. Listen, if you're not saved, you can be. Y'all heard that sermon in the song section. Confess your mouth, heat your Lord, believe your heart, God raised from the dead. You too can go to heaven. You shall be saved. Once we are saved, though, we have a loving obligation to the people, lost people around us, to blaze a true trail to heaven through Jesus Christ. Not to confuse them with our opinion, but to give God's pure word. If you've never accepted Jesus, please do that. And if you have done that, let's work together and start saying no to that self, that dying body, and yes to eternity. Let's go to the Lord.